last week we had um, the first lecture in our series on the novel energy system from Volker Stelzer. And now we will dig deeper into the social and ecological part. The ecological part is next week. And uh, today we have uh, the pleasure of talking about just energy transitions, about gender and diversity. And we're really happy to welcome Jenny Stevens um, for her presentation today. Jenny studied at Harvard University and California Institute of Technology, did her PhD on environmental science and engineering, and she's now professor and director of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University. And when I looked at her CV, there's so much more to say uh, about everything she did, and the list would be really long, but I thought uh, you can read it up on your own. And um, I'll rather start with a part from Jenny's book that I found uh, very motivating that I could relate to and that I'd like to read out. Um, it was about uh, Jenny listening to a presentation at your alma mater um, at Harvard from this, uh, on the Sunrise Movement in 2019. And you said that observing the interactions between the all-male Harvard faculty in the front row and the speaker, I was struck by the distance between them. A lack of appreciation and enthusiasm for this impressive activist leader from the established faculty members was noticeable and it felt unsettling. I knew several of these faculty members from early on in my career when I was a researcher at Harvard and I felt myself aligning more closely with Prakash. I was disappointed in the narrowness of the more established mainstream technocratic climate and energy work. And uh, yeah, when I read that passage, I was like, yeah, I can so much relate to that feeling. <laughs> and she's like, what, what are you talking about? Why are you neglecting the people part in that? And uh, yeah, I felt that like was a huge motivation uh, for me to change these things. I felt probably the same for most of us in this room um, today. Um, the motivation to change this distance between the technological and the social part and align them uh, way better. So today, Jenny is highly engaged in the topic of just transition passports, uh, published among other several articles in energy research and social science. And today she's here with us to present her new book from which I just quoted, Diversifying Power, Why We Need Anti-Racist Feminist Leadership on Climate and Energy. I found an incredible motivating book because you not only describe the problems, but also name a lot of very um, motivating and great examples of people who are already trying to bridge this gap and uh, doing great work for, like um, all in energy and the drop training program and um, yeah i'm very much looking forward for all of us to learn more about it and hopefully leave this uh leave this room after one and a half hours with the feeling that there that we can bridge the gap between technology and uh, society the agenda for today is about 35 minute presentations from jenny and then we will discuss that in smaller breakout groups that one of the organizing members will moderate and one of the breaking groups uh, will win Jenny as a moderator, so you can ask your questions directly. Um, for everyone else, there will be afterwards the chance in a, about 30 minutes uh, Q&A for your questions. And of course, if you have any questions in mind in between, feel free to post them in the chat and we will relate to that later. Uh, Jenny, so I'll, I'll leave the floor to yours and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Paula, and thank you all for being here. And um, I look, I, I appreciate also the format and the interactive component of this session. So uh, look forward to the breakout sessions and the discussion as well. Um, so as and, and also I want to congratulate you on well, not congratulate, but uh, acknowledge the importance of this series of kind of beyond um, technology and I uh, just recently wrote this book called Diversifying Power, Why We Need Anti-Racist Feminist Leadership on Climate and Energy. And it's really, um, it's a non-academic book. It's, it's more of a um, uh, motivating book to, to kind of give examples of different ways of thinking. Um, and, and I think really inspire us all to get involved in, in, in new and innovative ways of engaging with the climate and energy transformations um, that, are, that are happening. So um, it's great to have this opportunity uh, to, to speak about the book. And, and it's also really um, a book that came about based on where I am in my career. I've been working on climate and energy issues and sustainability transitions for my whole career. So about the last uh, 20, 25 years. And um, what I started to realize is that a lot of the 
mainstream approaches um, to dealing, thinking about climate and energy policy um, have really not been inclusive and kind of, if we just keep, and, and many people still feel like if we just keep trying even harder with the same approaches, um, then maybe we will make bigger change. And, and my, my, one of my basic uh, suggestions that I am making here is that um, we need to really rethink how we are approaching climate and energy and connect our climate and energy policy with social policy, with health policy, with housing, transportation, jobs, economic policy, and, and with concerns about social justice and economic justice. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the premise. Um, I'd like to begin um, just by, oops, sorry, I'm just trying to uh, give a little background on, on who I am and, and how I've come to uh, be writing this book and doing this work. Um, I actually have dual US EU citizenship. Uh, I was born in Dublin, Ireland, and my family moved to Boston when I was um, eight. I studied uh, environmental science and policy um, and then environmental science and engineering, um, and then started to get more into policy about energy and climate. I was a professor at Clark University, which is outside of Boston. Then I was at the University of Vermont, which is north of, of Boston. And then the past um, five years, I have been at Northeastern University, which is in Boston. Um, so I've had a transdisciplinary career in terms of um, the kind of at the interface of, so of society, technology and policy. And um, I want to start by just making the point that the climate crisis is really an economic issue and it's connected to the economic injustices that we see with the widening income and wealth gaps. Um, this figure is showing the United States but the same um, similar patterns are emerging throughout the world. Um, maybe it's, I think it's, it's perhaps worse in the United States, um, but there, the, this gap between the top 1% um, with both this concentration of wealth um, is also associated with a concentration of power um, in that the wealthy people have been influencing the politics and the, and the policies and what, what society is paying attention to um, in a very strategic way that we don't always connect with climate and energy, but in fact, um, it's very interconnected. Um, so, and this figure is actually pre-pandemic. And if you've seen any similar figures in the, rat, in the last year and a half, two years, um, it has gotten even worse uh, in terms of the billionaires are, get, are uh, becoming even you know, more billionaire, and most many people are are struggling even more than they were before the pandemic. So we have this very unsustainable economic injustice happening, and the reason this is actually directly connected to climate and energy is because the polluter elite, many of the fossil fuel interests, um, other corporate shareholders, and and uh, kind of the millionaire, billionaire class have been strategically investing to resist transformation. Um, and we, we know this now, we have a lot of social science and political science research that shows this, um, that the polluter elite have been investing with a misinformation campaign to deny climate science and confuse all of us about how severe, um, what are the dangers of burning fossil fuels for energy. Um, and do we really need to worry about the climate crisis? They've also been investing to undermine public trust in government and minimize worker protections and worker rights. It used to be that companies and corporations would pride themselves in how they treat their workers. Um, now, a lot of companies just try to minimize um, how much they have to invest in their workers and prioritize shareholder interests. And that is really a cultural shift in in um, corporate uh, world. So I propose that the climate crisis is really a crisis in leadership. It is not a scientific or a technological um, crisis. It's because of this concentration of wealth and power. And um, because of that also, we have been encouraged to focus on the technology um, without paying as much attention and without really investing as much as we should in social innovations 
and social change. Um, so I, I, I coined this term climate isolationism, which talks about, which refers to the way that a lot of our climate policies, a lot of climate experts, and a lot of climate discourse is focused on climate change as this separate problem um, that is often talked about in technocratic terms, in terms of uh, you know, the need to decarbonize and how much greenhouse gas emission reductions and how much temperature change can we accommodate and, and that kind of thing. Um, and it's also based on kind of this, oftentimes an assumption that we can somehow control uh, what's happening. And, and because of this kind of technocratic lens that often is very quantitative as well, um, and scientific and techni technical, um, we've missed opportunities for really responding to the climate crisis by investing in an improvements in the human condition. What do people and households and families need? Are people getting what they need? And if not, why? And what kind of bigger social changes do we need to make sure that we can better uh, distribute resources so that people are, are um, ha living fulfilling, healthy lives? So an alternative lens that I propose is this idea of energy democracy, which is about acknowledging we need to move away from fossil fuel based energy system toward a renewable based energy system. And if we see that rather than a technological substitution, which is so much more than that, um, see it instead as an opportunity to invest in people and communities and base those investments on social justice and human dignity on uh, local jobs, uh, local control, um, regional, regionally appropriate mix of renewable based um, energy that um, could be community owned or worker owned or all kinds of different models of how energy provisioning could be distributed. And then we can leverage the urgency from the climate crisis to um, advocate for these bigger societal changes. Um, and there's so many benefits beyond the climate crisis, why a, a distributed um, uh, renewable based energy system would be so, so, much, so much more beneficial um, than the, the current systems. So that's kind of the idea with energy democracy. The thing to remember about renewable energy um, is that this doesn't always come up in the policy discourse, but literally renewable resources are abundant, plentiful, free, and very reliable, right? Um, and so we know once we invest in the technologies to leverage those resources, every community in the world actually has access to some renewable resources, whether it be solar or wind, offshore or onshore, geothermal, wave, tidal. Um, there's so many possibilities and every community actually does have access um, if we invest in the right ways. So um, chapter one of the book is called Growing the Squad. Um, and what I talk about here and what the, the squad refers to these four junior congresswomen who came on the national stage in the United States just two years ago. And they totally changed the discourse about climate policy in the United States because they connected climate policy with jobs and economic justice. They connected it with racial justice and structural racism. And they connected it with housing and the housing crisis um, and homelessness. Um, and they based their, they based their leadership style on collaboration and inclusivity and participation. Um, it's really focused on distributing wealth and power, prioritizing investments in communities, reducing inequities and disparities by centering policy, all policies on social justice, racial justice, and economic justice, and really leveraging the potential for big transformation by linking these problems together, not thinking about all of these problems in isolation. And that kind of approach is what I call anti-racist feminist leadership, which I define as really just leadership that acknowledges the problematic, problematic power dynamics and the legacy of problematic power dynamics related to race and gender that are so prevalent in so many um, of our policies, processes, and, and priorities. So the opposite of anti-racist feminist leadership is patriarchal leadership 
that is based on this idea of intentionally excluding some people and, and assuming domination and competition. Um, and you can see in this photograph, um, you know, literally the only people involved and, and um, being presented in this photograph um, are white men. And that's very intentional kind of power that is being presented. And it's about actually concentrating wealth and power among those who already have wealth and power. Um, and it prioritizes investments to maximize corporate pro profits and, and the polluter elite, exacerbating inequities and racial and gender disparities. And the only way to sustain patriarchal leadership is to deny all of the systemic problems that we have. So um, this kind of leadership denies that there's a climate crisis that we need to respond to, has denied that the pandemic has been um, you know, is so bad, denies that we have an economic crisis, denies a housing crisis. So denial is a big part of sustaining the status quo um, in this form of patriarchal leadership. And that's what we all need to really be resisting. Um, so the rest of the book is um, going through examples of different creative, innovative leaders who are um, demonstrating this kind of anti-racist feminist leadership that is resisting uh, the polluter elite and connecting these issues in really creative and effective ways. So um, chapter two in the book is several strong leaders who are taking on the, the fossil fuel industry. Jackie Patterson, um, she was the um, head of the NAACP's environmental and climate justice program and she and her team um, came up with a lot of research and a report that really shows how the fossil fuel industry had been manipulating black communities in the United States in, in particular to get approval for a lot of fossil fuel infrastructure even though those same communities then were being disproportionately negatively impacted in terms of health consequences. Um, another leader, Jasmine Banks, is the executive director of Uncoke My Campus, um, which is an organization that has been revealing the depths of the fossil fuel industry on our education system and also in the court system. Um, Maura Healy is a leader um, in the state of Massachusetts, which is the state that, that I live in, um, and she has taken on ExxonMobil using our consumer protection laws to say that they are um, falsely presenting their product to the consumers when they say that their oil and gas is a green product. Um, so th the next chapter focuses on leaders that are connecting climate and energy explicitly with jobs and economic justice. And Varshini Prakash, uh, Paula mentioned in the excerpt that you read at the beginning, um, is the one of the founders and leaders of the Sunrise Movement, which is the youth movement in the United States that has been advocating for Green New Deal um, policies that connect explicitly climate and energy with economic justice and economic and job creation. And Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, one of the members of the squad, um, has been really instrumental in pushing for um, Green New Deal-like legislation that has been um, advanced, being advanced. Um, and then I also talk about uh, several leaders who are really not just thinking about um, creating jobs, but also workforce training and making sure that the workforce training, we have innovations in, in workforce training so that the jobs that are created are accessible to a lot of different people and communities, not just certain uh, more privileged communities. So Erica Mackey heads up Grid Alternatives, which is a solar installation company a nonprofit that also trains people in communities that have been underinvested in for too long, both in solar installation jobs um, and actually installing the solar in those communities. Esteban Kelly is the head of the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives and he's been really involved in getting um, the, uh, trying to encourage and support renewable companies to be worker owned cooperatives. So really, advancing different models of organizations for our renewable organizations. And Rowena Altmos is the head of All In Energy, which is an organization that's 
uh, focusing on workforce training of energy efficiency jobs and a lot of um, not just renewable installations, but there's a lot of um, opportunities in in energy efficiency and improving the efficiency of, of buildings and and other uh, and homes and all of that. So all of these leaders are really resisting the precarity, um, economic precarity that so we've kind of become, um, some of us, you know, some policies have become complacent to, the, to this. Um, and the fact that so many people are really struggling economically, especially young people looking ahead in the future, um, doesn't, you know, doesn't look good. I have two daughters myself, um, and they, uh, young adults, and they're looking at the, at the world ahead, and, and it's, it's scary um, future ahead. Um, and these leaders are also reclaiming the positive potential of making public investments um, and really focusing on this possibility of restructuring for a much more inclusive future economy. Um, the next chapter talks about leaders who connect climate and energy with health, well-being, and nutritious food for all. Um, Robert Bullard is often considered the father um, of environmental justice. So he um, is among the first researchers who really documented and did research showing how so much of the, the um, negative health impacts of fossil fuel infrastructure and other industrial infrastructure is really um, concentrated with um, black communities and, and other um, marginalized communities. And Mildred McLean is the head of Herbie House Citizens for Environmental Justice. And she's one of many black women in the United States who are saying, we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, Gina McCarthy is, a, is um, currently the White House National Climate Advisor under Obama. She was the head of the Environmental Protection Agency. She, throughout her career, has really been advocating for climate, the climate crisis to be um, a health issue and a focus in public health. Um, and because of a lot of her advocacy and, and others, you know, a lot of communities have now uh, declared the climate crisis a public health emergency. Um, Jillian Heshaw is a lawyer um, who has done a lot of uh, innovative work connecting um, climate and energy with agriculture and food production, particularly in the, in the South. Um, Mustafa Santiago Ali is the, uh, um, an advocate in the currently working for the National Wildlife Federation, but he's been an uh, advocate to point out how the vulnerabilities of climate change are also disproportionately um, uh, distributed and that really when we think about climate impacts, um, frontline communities, communities that have been under invested in for so long, including a lot of um, uh, black communities in the United States are much more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Dorsetta Taylor is a researcher who pointed out how white the environmental community ha has been. And because of the whiteness of who's involved in environmentalism, we haven't been paying attention to some of these health uh, disparities as much as we would or could if um, the environmentalism had been more inclusive. And I mentioned Jacinda Ardern here, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, as a leader who, you know, particularly in the beginning of the pandemic, was really um, demonstrated this kind of leadership that takes very strict evidence-based measures in terms of controlling the coronavirus, but and then explaining to people in very compassionate and empathetic terms why these measures are essential, not just for your own individual health or the health of your family but for the health of the community and um, the whole country. So um, the next chapter is about leaders who are connecting climate and energy with transportation and uh, really focusing on transit equity. Um, uh, representative Ayanna Presley, who's actually one of the members of the squad, she's the representative who represents me in Massachusetts. Um, she's been, really been a leader um, pointing out that national level transportation investments are have not been um, considering equity very much at all, and that um, we really need to reconsider transportation investments to be more inclusive. 
Michelle Wu is a Boston city councilor and she's running for mayor of Boston right now. And she has a proposal for a Green New Deal for Boston um, in which she's proposing free public transportation um, in that we have free roads and bridges in a lot of places, um, but then we expect um, public transit is often the same price for everyone. And given the huge economic uh, disparities in, in many cities, including Boston, it's a much bigger burden for low income people to take public transit than, than um, others. So that the, the idea of making public transit free is really an, a way to economically open up opportunities for, for many people. Um, in this chapter, I also mentioned Greta Thunberg as uh, an example of a leader who, um, particularly with the transportation, uh, she demonstrated when she came over to North America for the climate conferences, when was that? Two or th three years ago, I guess now. Um, you know, she, she didn't take an airplane, right? She, she sailed across the Atlantic, both directions. Um, um, the next chapter is about leaders who are connecting climate energy with housing and um, Representative Ilhan Omar, another member of the squad, she has really been a national leader in the United States, pointing out how we need massive investments in housing because we really do have a housing crisis and a huge increase in housing insecurity. Um, there's an organization that has evolved called Moms for Housing in Oakland, California, which it emerged from an incident where four women mothers who ha were housing insecure, they didn't have a place to live, had nowhere to go. Um, they occupied a vacant uh, house in Oakland and um, the developer who owned it um, contacted the authorities and the authorities came to evict the, the mothers. And they sent, literally they sent um, military style um, people with guns and tanks in the middle of the night to, to evict these women and their children from this vacant home. And they leveraged that experience to create an organization called Moms for Housing, which is advocating for housing as a human right um, and, and really elevating the need for major investments in, in basic housing. Um, Final example here are some indigenous women in Canada um, who they call themselves the tiny house warriors and they are um, connecting their own cultural association with the land as their home with building these small tiny houses on wheels that they are um, able to move to protest and resist the building of a fossil fuel trans Canada pipeline. Um, so they are using the 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 home to to resist fossil fuel infrastructure. So um, the last chapter of the book is about how we can all get involved and in co our co collective action to encourage these larger transformations and really connecting climate and energy with all of these other issues, with this new kind of leadership. And and when I talk about leadership here, I like to emphasize that leadership isn't just CEOs of companies and elected officials, right? Like we are all leaders in our own organizations, in our communities, in our families. Um, and we all can act as leaders and inspire others to take action and, and think of themselves as leaders. Um, we can all get involved in advocating for bigger systemic changes. Um, we all need to acknowledge and continue to understand and unlearn the racism and sexism that is so um, built into so many ways that we interact with each other, so many of our processes, our, our policies, our, even the way we do research, all kinds of ways. And we need to be constantly reevaluating and acknowledging and exploring um, and unlearning um, those, those practices. We also um, need to focus on voting and helping others to vote. You may have heard that in the United States right now, um, there's a, even a stronger than ever campaign to make voting heart more difficult um, so that to restrict who has access to voting. Um, you know, I really think we should be striving in every democratic society for 100% voter participation. Um, there's really no reason why we shouldn't expect 100% voter participation, but the numbers are so, are not ever at 100% so that we can all work on voting. Um, 
and really prioritizing diversity, equity, inclusion in all levels of our interactions and, and, our, and, and what we're involved in. We can all get involved in advocating for local community renewable energy projects. We can all, especially those of us in an academic setting, um, can leverage data and science and information to justify the changes that we um, are advocating for. And we can all get involved in supporting cooperatives and novel economic structures. Um, and, and obviously it's a very divisive time. So we also need to listen to each other and not villainize each other um, and try to understand where people are coming from and why um, this divisiveness has actually been quite orchestrated in a sense. Um, and so don't give in to it and try to listen and learn to each other from each other as well. I'll end here just by acknowledging Mary Robinson, um, the former president of Ireland. She, as, a, as an international climate justice leader, she has, um, um, you know, made the case that none of this is actually that radical. It shouldn't seem radical. Um, it's actually, if you just prioritize a people's first approach, like what do people need and how can we invest in ways to make sure people are getting what they need, we would be making very different kinds of, of investments. And I also um, mentioned here Shirley Chisholm, who um, was the first black woman to run for president in the United States in 1972, um, quite, a, quite a while ago now. Um, and you know, in some ways, we've come a long way since 1972. And in other ways, um, we have not come as far as many of us might have thought we could or should have. So um, I will end there. And I'll, I'll just mention uh, one final point here with, with my book. Um, all the author proceeds for the book uh, are being donated to the NAACP's Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Um, so if you are interested in, in buying a copy of the book, um, the, it goes toward advancing this, this kind of work. Um, and um, it's great to have this opportunity to talk about some of these ideas with, with all of you. So I can stop sharing now and um, we can move on to the the next section. Thank you.